So, hello everyone. My name is uh, Michael Green, and as you can hear from the name, I'm uh, not a Dane. Uh, my dad's American, and my mom's Swedish. So, so sorry. <laughs> or I can also talk louder. Is this uh, is this enough? Okay, great. So, uh, like I said, I have a little bit of mixture. Uh, my English is okay. My Danish is horrible. So it's actually good that I'm uh, giving this in English. Um, I'm here to talk to you about how to actually integrate AI into your, into your business and what it actually means to integrate it. Because there are several different versions of how to do that. And there are unfortunately more ways to fail than to success. And, uh, and I'll tell you about some of the failures that I've personally created <laughs> and uh, so that you can avoid doing them. And uh, I will also tell you about some of the things that I have tried that actually worked. Uh, what we'll go through is basically a short introduction, uh, reiterating what we already heard about the AI hype. Uh, everybody's doing AI today, and it's, it's the reason for that. And that's that AI has come to mean basically everything that involves computers or math or a combination thereof. <laughs> basically, everything that strives from making a multiple lo logistic regression model to taking two averages and comparing them. So everything is AI which also means that almost nothing is AI. So I'm going to try to be a little bit more specific about what you need to solve your specific AI problem. The strategy that you need to employ to actually make sure that the entire organization is streamlined towards this goal uh, is also very, very important. And that actually comes before setting the organization. You have to have the strategy in order first. Um, so a little bit about me. Why, why am I here? Why do I think that I have uh, something to offer in this space? Uh, well, that's basically because I have tried to apply AI sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully to a lot of different fields. I started back in, uh, in the early 2000s uh, building AI for robots. I actually taught small robot dogs how to play football. I even competed in the World Robotic Soccer Championship. And I didn't win. <laughs> uh, I came in third. Um, and the task at that time was to get this tiny little robot to see the ball, you know, just see the ball and slowly move towards it. And I had approximately two CPU cycles to, to achieve that. So it was a lot of C++ programming, a lot of embedded problems, a lot of specific SDKs made by Sony, God bless them, um, and a robot that just neglected to do what you wanted it to do. So at that time, it was probably one of the smallest neural networks that I've ever built, but I did succeed to actually make the robot recognize the ball in a very controlled environment and actually shoot it into the goal. Just too late. Um, the ambition of this entire incentive with robotic soccer is to, by the year 2050, build a soccer team that is capable of beating the world champions, the human world champions, that is. And uh, towards the end of this talk, you might get a feel for whether or not that is a realistic agenda. Uh, after, after that, I actually started building uh, software for, uh, for physicians to, to help them make better decisions regarding if a person has the, you know, not possibility might be the wrong word, but risk of dying of acute coronary syndromes. That's a collective name for a lot of different heart diseases. So physicians today, they get a lot of patients in and they might uh, you know, have chest pains or abdominal pains or they might have a weird e ECG. There might be many different things that are, that are wrong with them, right? But it's very, very hard to detect what the actual cause is. So at that time, we built the neural networks to help the physicians get better at this. And it actually turned out that the models we built were way better than the best physicians uh, in the world together. The problem was that in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, Hospitals were not ready to use AI to make decisions, not even ready to use AI to aid decisions. So I learned a valuable lesson there that even if you have a technology that solves a problem, that doesn't mean that people will adopt it. So adoption is, is also key. Even if you have solved the problem, that doesn't mean that people will magically buy your product or even want to use your product. So adoption here is key. At SimCorp, uh, I basically built uh, models for trying to predict prices of, uh, of different assets. Uh, that was a lot of Monte Carlo, uh, a lot of other stuff that relates to how can we actually make an edge uh, for our investment strategies. Again, a completely different area, but uh, core to that is still uh, the AI part. At Group M, uh, I solved marketing problems using AI. 
And uh, I've, we actually, that actually also went pretty well. And it went so well that we went to, uh, to the big guys and said, hey, this actually works pretty well. Why don't we use that instead of humans to plan media? And uh, that I then realized that that was not the business model uh, of the company I was working for. So uh, <laughs> uh, that also sort of started and spun off uh, the idea of, uh, of Blackwood 7 and the idea that you could actually automate this. Uh, and uh, Blackwood 7 was started back in 2013, uh, which was a pretty interesting journey. Uh, we took that company from, uh, from just a few employees to, to a 220 man strong company in, uh, with offices uh, in many different areas of the world. And one of the most important things is that we changed that company from being sort of a media and tech company into an AI first company that really cared about developing something that solved this very domain specific problem. And uh, I'm actually quite open with my opinions uh, and criticisms of, of AI. So there's, uh, you can Google it if you want to read it, if you're interested. Uh, if you're not, then, then, then don't. <laughs> um, I also have uh, gotten the feedback that sometimes I come across as a bit of a bit of a negative person with respect to utilizing AI. And let me clear that from now on. I want everybody to use AI. I just want people to be responsible and careful and actually think about the consequences. Because much like uh, Elon Musk, I mean, I don't agree with him, but he does have a point. Uh, just mindlessly deploying technology without thinking about the consequences, that can eventually bite you in the butt. And it could be a good idea to think about that. So that leads me to the AI hype trap. And just like Anna showed you, there's, there's sort of a curvature here, right? And, and it's very familiar. And right now we're at the top, 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 top. Everybody believes that whatever problem you have, you can just take AI and throw it at it and it will magically solve it. This is not the case. Let me, let me just say that, that is not the case. Whenever you see sort of a, a GitHub repo and you download a Python script, you, you run it and you see that, oh, there's an image and it detects stuff. What this doesn't show you, what, what the simplicity of running that script doesn't show you is the blood, sweat and tears that the, not person, people put into selecting the network, selecting the architecture, uh, training it on copious amounts of data, investigating why it didn't work, because I promise you they failed a thousand times to the one time that they succeeded. And, uh, and this is a big problem in, in AI that we uh, as a company uh, are actually trying to solve by creating machines that actually care about the models themselves. Um, but I'll talk more about that later. So before you do anything, make sure you actually need AI for your product. And even if you just need it for marketing, then that's fine, but just acknowledge that. Don't, don't hire an, an AI research team just because you need the marketing value of AI. That, that's, that's, not, that's not logical. There are many better ways of doing that. There's also another thing uh, about this, and that is that most of the models that are built today <coughs> never gets deployed. Most models today are being built in Python notebooks, and they stay there for very good reasons because you just don't deploy a machine learning algorithm. It is very hard because today what a machine learning algorithm does, it looks at the data and it finds every little piece of this data that you've shown it and it learns to map this data to the output that you want it to, to learn. But it hasn't learned the fundamental nature of your data. It hasn't learned about the fundamental nature of your problem and it doesn't care because you never told it to care. So, so that basically means that you have to be very, very vigilant in making sure that once you deploy a machine learning alg algorithm that you've actually covered your cases. It's very important. That all being said, AI, just like uh, Bezos said, it will definitely be useful for everyone. In every segment, whatever your product, service, or offering is, AI will make it better if deployed uh, the way it should be. There's no doubt about that. You, you, you literally cannot make it worse if you do your due diligence. So what do you come into when you're actually doing uh, what I call the, the data science loop? Is that there's something which is sort of a knowledge and perhaps a question that you have. And there's also the data part. But before you actually start building models, you have to formulate your problem. You have to take that knowledge that you have and you have to make assumptions. And that is really key. Don't just throw data at someone and say, tell me answers. Because without formulating that first question, you will not get a useful answer back. You cannot do science that way. It's impossible. It cannot be done. 
So therefore, you have to make the right assumptions, then you can discover the patterns, and then you have the predict and explore phase where you see, does this make sense? Can I, uh, can I use this in my product? Does it provide viable, useful answers for the product or the service? And uh, most often, the first few times, it doesn't. <laughs> So that means that you have to criticize the model. And this criticism has to come from several different parts of the organization. It has to come from the st statisticians or the data scientists or the machine learning engineer or the data engineer. It has to come, and very importantly, from the business owners, from the people who own the product, from the people who are supposed to sell this product to end users. Their feedback is invaluable to making sure this works. Because most companies should never do AI for the sake of AI. You should do AI because it helps your product. And if the end user who uses it don't think that it's a cool addition, then you're doing something wrong. So this feedback loop is super important to make sure that it actually fits your product. So then we come to the strategy. But the first thing you should do, if you actually are serious about AI and want to utilize it, you should hire someone who owns that. You should hire maybe a chief analytics officer, or a chief AI officer, or a chief data officer, just someone who can sort of own this. And what is really key about this person is that this person has to have bridges to all of C-level managers. Basically, this, this guy has to be best buddies with the C, uh, CTO, the CMO, the CFO, the CEO, because all of them will rely on this person for advice. And, and it's not enough that you're just connected to, to the CEO. You have to be really tight with the, with the CTO of the company if you have this role. So making sure that everyone sort of is aligned and that analytics actually is something that, that you want to make a core part of your business. It has to sort of seep through the entire business. Now there are basically three main structures that you can take when you do this. Either you can have the the one that you probably should select for, for someone who, who's not very interested in AI and probably doesn't need anything bespoke. You should probably go with the IT-centric uh, approach because there, IT is responsible for, for, using, uh, for using and deploying your, your machine learning algorithms or your models or whatever it is. And there, there, are, there are numerous vendors. There's the Google, there's uh, Amazon, there's, uh, there's even uh, Microsoft, and a lot of the other big guys uh, have sort of platforms that you can use for that. Uh, that's called ML as a service, and uh, you can even have the infrastructure there. Uh, and that basically means that you're responsible for what you want to get out of it, and of course the analytics afterwards that comes out. This is sort of the, the cheapest way of running things, if you can control the costs. The second part is the integrated structure. That's when you want a bigger ownership of your, of your AI. That's when you really want to look at, can I actually tweak this model? Can I actually make something... Um, more bespoke for, for my business. Maybe I can develop a small part that's used together with the with already existing uh, topics. And there you sort of combine ML as a service with custom ML, uh, machine learning platforms. Uh, but still, the IT infrastructure and the de deployment of the model still lies within IT. So there maybe in the first case you have a one or two data scientists or something like that, a, a very sort of small organization. The third one is a specialized one. That's when you really want to change. You want to change something fundamental. You want to build something groundbreaking. Maybe change uh, uh, an algorithm or change the foundation of an algorithm or change the way we relate to data, whatever it is. Um, that's something like, like, like we do, for example, or I'm sure that uh, Absu is also doing. And that's really there. there you, you can't run with the IT-centric or the integrated part because your business is AI. You don't have another product. Your product is AI and the betterment of AI. And if that is the case, you have no choice. You have to build an expensive research team that actually does the due diligence and actually does the research uh, that that requires. So for the IT-centric structures, what would you, that there's sort of pros and cons to this, right? I think that the, the pros are that it's really fast to get up and running. You, you can take any one of the off-the-shelf algorithms. You can say, I have these inputs, and I would like it to learn these outputs. It's pretty simple, and there, there are REST APIs or whatever you can use to, to get that up and running. Very simple. You don't know what's going on sort of behind the scenes, but maybe you don't care. Maybe you don't have to. Um, but there are also sort of cons, and that's you have to pay for everything, right? Since, since it's a platform, you, you pay for training of the model, you pay for the data storage, you pay for the outputs probably, and you just pay for a lot of things because uh, Amazon is, has built a, a nice business around this and, and many of the other platform businesses also have. So this can quite quickly become expensive if you don't control the experiments that you run. 
or don't control the models that you run. So, so it requires you to really think about how you want to use it and what your budget really is. So you have to make sure that the AI budget or model building budget really is on par with what you're trying to get. For the integrated structure, um, there sort of you have, you have focus on the, on the innovation part, not necessarily the algorithmic innovation part, but the innovation part of your product and your model or your uh, service for that matter. So there you actually need data scientists working together with the, with the sort of engineers or, or with the product owners or whatever it is to sort of together find a solution that, re that really matches. So this, is sort of, this can also be a little bit costly because you have to attract these uh, data scientists or machine learning engineer or whoever you, you, you want to attract. I'll talk more about the different roles later that you can select and what they do and what they don't do. Um, uh, and also, uh, yeah, I'll, I will come back to that actually. But this actually allows you uh, a high flexibility. You have the possibility of having people that understand algorithms, but you don't have to force them to reinvent the wheel. They can use what's already there to actually capitalize upon the hard work that, that other people have done and actually focus on the innovation part and not focus on you know, the outer cases of the algorithm itself. That, that is something that probably doesn't make sense for most businesses. And I would say most of the businesses who want to use AI in, in, their, um, in their product or services either belong to category one or category two. So uh, if you are in this, uh, you have to think about how will you actually capture data science talent and how will you actually keep them interested. Uh, because as we heard before, data scientists today are, someone has described it as the sexiest job of the 21st century. I don't know if sexy is the word I would use, but, uh, but it definitely is something that people, uh, that people seem to want in organizations now. And actually retaining this talent is quite hard because they're high salaries. And that's a problem that we have in Denmark that our salaries are typically not that high compared to if you move to San Francisco, for example, or if you move uh, to China, or, uh, there, there the salaries are also way, way, way better for these guys. So, so we, uh, as a country here, also have a challenge actually retaining and attracting talent to the country itself. And that is also going to be uh, a challenge that we all have to face sooner or later. So, the good part about this, uh, or one of, the, one of the bad part, is actually the cross silo. Uh, you have to make sure that the data science team actually talks together with the rest of the organizations. So that you don't, you don't consider them as, as a separate thing that just, you know, go do your stuff and then afterwards we'll use that. That doesn't work. You have to have a very tight collaboration. Otherwise, they will invent lots of cool stuff, but maybe, maybe nothing is useful in the end. That happens. Uh, the specialized structure is... Uh, is of course what it sounds like. That is a highly targeted team, targeted only towards algorithms, development, sort of describing what's the best way to relate to data. Uh, so that takes an approach that, that is, you know, what is intelligence? How, 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 do we, how do we even approach this topic? And can we make something better than what we have today? Uh, that's really what these guys should do. And, uh, and most businesses, uh, will probably not need to do that because there's also, unless you, you get very, very, very good people within this, this area, there's a high risk of failure. Um, and, uh, and actually the other day, <laughs> we, I mean, I say that there's a shortage of these people, but uh, there's not a shortage of applications for these, uh, for these different uh, positions that, that, that you have. Uh, the other day I got an email from, uh, from a guy who had been hospitalized for three months, I think. And during these three months, apparently, while in sickbed, he invented a quantum computer, I guess from the plastic around his bed, and he turned that quantum computer into a programming machine that actually learned to think, act, and respond independently, just like a human being. And he just wanted to share that knowledge with me and, and see if I could offer him a job. And you'd be surprised how many of these emails uh, I, actually, I actually get. Uh, so there, there's no shortage of people thinking that they have something to offer in AI. And, um, that probably also has to do with the hype cycle. I mean, he could be right. I don't know. I don't know him personally, but uh, odds are he's not. So organization part, um, the modern data scientist. That's, that's sort of the unicorn uh, that everyone is talking about. And, and, and let me just clear this now. These people do not exist. There is no person in the world that fits this bill. This is a wishful scenario because this this poses a person 
that not only has spent their entire life studying maths, physics, and, and, and high degree of computer program, and then on top of that, you expect them to be social beasts that can just charm the pants out of anyone. These people don't exist. You know, you have a finite amount of time in your life and you have to spend that wisely. So, so this data scientist that, that we all want to hire, I mean, odds are we can't get them. And if we can, there are maybe, I don't know, 10 people in the world like that. So, you know, and they are pretty well paid now, I would assume. So, so f forget about that and, and, and actually focus on the, on the skills that this sort of unicorn would possess and then find people with these skills and attract that talent. That's the job. Um, because if someone says that they have all these skills, odds are they're lying. Or they know this person from the sick bed who invented the quantum computer. So if we break this down, this data scientist role into, into what they actually have to be able to do, right? There's the very, very important part. And I would say, I would argue probably the most important part for most businesses is actually know your data. Know your data. Know what you have. Know what you don't have. Know whether or not this is actually useful. There are tons of data out there that is, you know, 100% unequivocal crap. It should never be used for anything. And, and realize that before you start mining it. Because if you mine crap, you will get enriched crap. That's not a useful thing. I mean, maybe it's someone, I don't know, but not to me. So the data architect, what this guy is supposed to do, or girl is supposed to do in the, in the organization, is to take on the role of how do we actually structure data? How do we find data? How do we enrich it? How do we take third party sources and combine them into something that's more valuable than the individual pieces? Very important part. Typically they should be skilled at uh, SQL, XML, Hive, Pig, Hadoop, Spark, all of these things that, that sort of interact with big data structures. Most of all, they should be an architect by mind. So they should be able to, to see how you can actually make these things talk together. The data engineer, on the other hand, is the, is the sort of sidekick to the data architect. This guy or girl should be super structured and be able to look at the, all the ETL process and make sure that you can actually transfer data between these different silos. Make sure that everyone can utilize the data. Make sure that the data is tested, pristine, clean, and useful. That's that guy's job. And, uh, and they have a lot, of stuff, a lot of stuff in their toolbox, and these guys are also quite hard to find, actually. Um, if you look at the analysis part, what do we need there? Well, a data analyst is, is actually really good to have because the data analyst actually can look at data itself and see, is, is this actually useful? Uh, what can I do with this type of data? Can I build models out of this data? Because there's some data where you simply cannot build models of today. And, and they sort of should, should know whether or not this is actually useful. Uh, typically, they know R, Python, uh, actually JavaScript or uh, SQL. And I write JavaScript not because they have to write web pages, but because JavaScript actually have quite advanced algorithms also implemented in it. Um, you can actually do TensorFlow in JavaScript today, which is quite interesting. On the other side, you have the business analyst. This, this person should be able to, to look at the business as a whole. Does it make sense for me to actually engage with this track? Should I, from a business perspective, analyze this? And what does it mean for me as a company? What does it mean for my, for my customers? Can we increase their revenue by providing this service? All of those things that come from, from knowing the KPIs of your customers or, or your own organization, that's what the business analyst would, would do. And, um, and they basically uh, realize what the, what the CEO should do, but on an operational level. Now, from a machine learning point of view, and this is I mean, what, what it's about <laughs> today, um, you have the data scientist, right? Uh, the unicorn that we talked about. And, and I say data scientist there. I started with that, but I also say because that's also a role that many people get, and then they sort of get comfortable into it. And many data scientists actually end up doing something very specific and bespoke. Uh, so not sort of this wide thing at all. Um, they typically operate in anything from, from R, SAS, Python, MATLAB, to whatever they actually learned. And typically they learn that at, the, at school, and then they stick to it. The machine learning engineer, that's sort of a person that is able to take an algorithm and, and implement it using known tools. Like seeing uh, an algorithm in, in a paper, for example, and uh, implementing it in, uh, in TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever they choose. They're expert at these frameworks and they can implement models quite freely. They don't always have to understand what goes on behind the scenes, but they can utilize these packages to create models that, that are at least statistically useful, right? Uh, very hard to find, um, very expensive, but very skilled people. Then you have on the other side, which is also related to the data science, the data journalist. Uh, this, this is a position that, that usually reports to the C-level structure, right? That, that uh, do all the fancy plots 
about the stuff that you can do with your algorithms that visualizes it for the sea level or for, for your customers. And they're more like journalists because they have to write, they have to tell a story. What does data tell us? And they have to be able to, to tell that story in, a, in an intriguing manner. It's, a, it's actually, yeah, it doesn't have so much to do with data science as it has to do with journalism uh, as a whole and, and being able to pitch and sell a story. Now, the platform part. Now, if you look at whether or not you want to develop something completely bespoke in-house, and when I say develop something in-house, there are the two pieces, right? Either you can make your own platform that, that you sort of build your ML onto, um, that's one, or you can, you can buy something uh, that has already been pre-made. You can also have your in-house development team, or you can have an outsourced development team, and then you can combine these uh, in different things. And, and from the beginning of it, it can, it can seem like it's a very good idea, to just hire a data scientist and send, then say, you know, go crazy and build everything in-house because you feel that you can control everything, right? But that comes with a very expensive maintenance cost. It is hell maintaining these systems, especially since you have no customers of that system. This system is only meant for you in-house, right? It is not something that propagates into your, into your customers, so the revenue doesn't, doesn't actually cover that part. So you're taking on a huge maintenance burden that's actually not even related to your product. And, and that's something that you usually shouldn't do. Uh, it's much better to, to pay Google or Amazon or, or Abso or us <laughs> to do that for you. Um, and also, when it comes to outsource or insource the development on that platform, there you can either uh, hire expensive uh, people to, to code it for you, or you can build a team that actually can operate that platform. Um, and I, I think it's, it makes a lot of sense to have a team that can operate that platform so that you can own the results and the models that come out. You don't want those to end up in the hands of consultants. Because whenever something goes wrong with the model, you have to pay those consultants again to retrain it. Because trust me on this, there's no model in the world that doesn't need to be retrained. You need to continuously update it, just like we heard from the previous speaker. You cannot take a model, build it once, deploy it into the wild and say, God, I'm happy that's done. You know, that, it doesn't work that way. You have to continuously train this model, improve it with new data, better data, more data. All of these things have to happen all the time. So that's why I think it's, it's a very good idea to outsource what you can and, and pay yourself out of that because it will be cheaper in the long run. Um, and, but, but you should have a team in-house that knows how to operate that platform. That's sort of the take-home message. And the last part I want to say before we're running out of complete time is that how do you create this winning team? And I think the most important part when you create this team is actually to, to look at, you have to define the purpose. You can't just hire a data science team or an AI team and then afterwards figure out what they're supposed to do for you. Make sure the organization has the wish, the, the power to actually embrace this and utilize this team to its full potential. And then hire people for roles, not for titles. Don't hire people for titles, that, 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 that's a horrible idea. Just hire them for things they can do, not for things they want on their CV. Uh, also, you should always foster cross-functional collaboration. So if you have a data science team or an AI team, you should make sure that they collaborate with everyone in the organization, that everyone talks together. Otherwise, you might end up developing two different products within the same company. And that's rarely a good idea. And then practice embedding to a fault, make sure that everyone is responsible, they know what they're doing, they know what the end goal of what they're doing is supposed to be. Don't say build algorithms for us, say build algorithms so that we can. It's super important because otherwise you get data science people saying that I'm just building my algorithms and I'm happy with that, but they have no idea about the potential of how much they can improve the business because if they know that you get champions in your organization and champions is what you want in your organization to help you build, grow, and sustain that. And that's it. Thanks.